Um, welcome to this lecture by Dr. Brad Roderick, who uh, has been for the last number of years Professor of Mission at Memphis Theological Seminary. Is that the, the right name? Mid-America Theological Seminary in Memphis, uh, and is here um, interviewing for a position to teach at Trinity. We're really glad to have Brad and his wife Gretchen with us. Uh, here in person, we have uh, sheets of paper on, on chairs, so if any students would like to uh, fill out those sheets of paper while, we're, while Brad's lecturing and, and give it to a member of faculty, that would be very, very helpful. Uh, let's, uh, let's just open in prayer as Brad comes to give us this lecture. Father, thank you that you are with us and that you love us. Thank you for your love for the world. And we pray that as we think together about mission, you will encourage us and teach us uh, and send us out in the power of your spirit to be your people in the world. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So welcome, Brad. Well, it is uh, very good to be here with you today. Uh, we've been looking forward to this opportunity to come and see the campus, see Ambridge, and be with you. Um, my name is Brad. I'll just give you a little bit of an introduction to myself. I was raised pagan. Uh, my dad was from a Mormon family, but he had turned his back on uh, that faith and became an atheist. My mom was raised an atheist. When I started kindergarten, she went back to school. She dropped out of high school in the 10th grade to get married. So we went to school at the same time. Uh, she took a world religions class and thought, I don't want any religion, but if I were going to be anything, I would be Hindu. And she was more or less new age before new age was cool. Um, so we were raised nothing. Uh, when I was a senior in high school, my parents divorced and they both moved out. I was living with my brother and his girlfriend and just had a lot of questions about life and what was important and where did I belong. And so a Methodist, uh, actually a Pentecostal, had a Methodist take me to a Baptist revival. And that was the first time I'd been inside a church building and heard the story of Jesus. And at the end of the service, the pastor said, Anybody wants to know anything else, come forward and, and talk to me here. So I went to the front of the church, and he said, are you a Christian? And I thought, I'm looking for a place to belong. If I tell him, no, I'm not a Christian, I'm telling him, no, I don't belong. So first thing I did in the church was lie. I said, <laughs> yes, I'm a Christian. Join the church. We did a play that year about the life of Christ, and lo and behold, they asked me to play Jesus. Um, that was not typecasting, whatever the opposite of typecasting is. So we were in Atlanta, Georgia on a mission trip, and I was on the cross, and the choir was singing a song called Behold the Man, and I heard Jesus say to me, uh, you have been learning about me like you learned about George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, but I am alive, and I want to have a relationship with you, and I want to bring you into relationship with the Father. And that was when I understood what it meant to give my life to Christ and to become a follower of Christ. And immediately, uh, without any split second of difference, he said, just like you, there are people all over the world who don't know this message. And so I became a follower of Christ and was called the missions simultaneously. Uh, went to college, went to seminary, went to New England to plant a church. My mom said, you're supposed to be looking for people to join your church. Just focus on young, pretty girls. And uh, I met Gretchen. She was literally a, a hot prospect. Uh, so uh, we met and married there, went back, and I did uh, doctoral studies at New Orleans Seminary and then spent 10 years planting churches in the Northeast. I uh, lived in Harrisburg for a while, and then we spent 20 years in Asia, uh, mostly in India, but uh, traveling around uh, throughout South and Southeast Asia. About five years ago, had the opportunity to return to the States to continue what we had been doing, which is uh, training and preparing missionaries. And so that's what we've been doing for the last several years in Memphis. And uh, could tell a lot more story about then how did we end up becoming Anglican and all of those other things that are going on. And maybe we'll grab some tea or something later and we can have those conversations. But brings us to today. And uh, I was asked to come and to present something. And as I was praying about what would I talk about, what, what would be the focus or the, the, the time, 
I really missed having a lectionary. I like the concept of I don't have to decide what I want to talk about. It's already set out for me. I tell people the, there are two really good things about the lectionary and lectionary preaching. One is that the lectionary picks the passage for you so you don't always preach your hobby horse. But the other thing is the Bible is all about missions. So whatever the lectionary passage is, it's going to be about missions. All right, so I'm good. However, there's one verse that I would argue is not at its heart a missionary verse, and that is the verse that is always given as the heart of the missionary call. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. The core verse that refers to the, the Great Commission, that refers to missions, I don't think that's a verse about missions at all. I think that's a passage about discipleship. And so that's what I actually want to talk about today. I want to talk about what does it mean to be a disciple. And when I was asked to give kind of a, a, a title for this, I said circular logic, because we're going to look at a couple of circles related to uh, disciple making. So first of all, just what, it, what is a disciple? How would you define a disciple? What is your definition? A follower of Christ? Someone who's put on Christ? Someone who's put on Christ? A learner. A learner? Right, that's the basic definition of the word. Uh, in the West, we tend to think of a disciple as someone who has a lot of knowledge, right? So the mature disciple is the guy that has a lot of knowledge about the gospel. The guy that you want to be on your team if you're playing Bible trivia. The guy that can name all of the kings of Israel backwards. Like this guy is an incredible disciple. And then we might see this other person who's a new believer. They don't know enough yet. They're not strong enough yet. They're not mature because they don't have a lot of knowledge. And so traditionally in the West, knowledge equals maturity. Uh, on the mission field, there became over the last 10, 20 years, a big debate over what's more important, knowledge or obedience. And, and I had friends that would say, well, if this guy knows a lot, but he's not obeying very much, and this person only knows three things about Jesus, but they're doing two of them, this is actually the ma more mature disciple. So they would say that maturity is more related to obedience. Is it knowledge or is it obedience? Well, I'm not very good at either or answers. I think maybe because we spent so much time in South Asia, uh, I've really become more of a both and kind of person in my understanding of things. And I don't think it's a question of do we want knowledge or do we want obedience? How can you obey the commands of Christ if you don't know what they are? We have to have knowledge. But what's the point of knowing? The devils know and they tremble. If we don't have obedience, the knowledge is useless. So it's a matter of both ends. So discipleship is knowledge and obedience. Let's see how this... It's more a question of where knowledge and obedience overlap is where we begin to see discipleship. So we've got knowledge and obedience, and they're coming together, and that makes discipleship. Except, started thinking about this a little bit longer, I'm going to tell you the answer isn't Jesus. Okay? So don't, don't say Jesus. As a group of people, who in the New Testament had the greatest knowledge and the greatest obedience to that knowledge? As a group of people, <laughs> can you think of any group of people that knew the letter of the law and did everything they could to obey it fully? Pharisees. So the goal of disciple making is to create Pharisees. Okay, so maybe there's something missing, right? We, we need another circle. Um, so our third circle is going to be relationship. Making a disciple is helping someone understand the truths of God 
to live out the truths of God and to do that while walking in relationship with Christ. Which brings us back to Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Anybody just want to pop that verse out? What is Matthew 28, 18 through 20? We go there for making disciples of all the earth, God has the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them. Teaching them. Okay. Okay, let's. A lot of the words are out there, so let's start to put some of those words together. First of all, this is Jesus commanding his apostles, sending them out with his task, and it is to go and make disciples. Right? So that's why I say this isn't about missions, it's about disciple making, and Jesus is telling us to make disciples, but then he gives us his definition. And a word that I heard several of you say is no, teaching them to know whatsoever things I have commanded. Is that what it says? Teaching them to obey whatsoever things I have commanded. So teach them to obey, and lo, I am with you. So Matthew 28, 18 through 20 pulls all three parts of that definition together. When Jesus defines discipleship himself, we are going to go and introduce people to Christ. We're going to baptize them, bring them into the fellowship of faith, bring them into the church, then teach them everything that Jesus did and how to live that out. But to do that in this relationship. And so kind of an overarching circle here, we are to go into all of the world and make disciples, teaching them to obey and knowing that he is with us wherever we go. Think through what we normally do uh, when we're doing education, when we're doing worship, whether it's Sunday school, whether it's seminary, whether it's having a, a, a lunch with a friend that's having questions about how to follow Christ. Uh, there are certain things that we're going to do that can really help. Um, if we want to try to have a full, uh, we want to do review, new and do, or we want to have relationship time. We want to have teaching. And then we want to talk about obedience. Okay, so if we're going to get all of these three things into any disciple-making activity, whether it's a Sunday morning liturgy, or if it's a Tuesday lunch, or if it's a Bible study class or a seminary training, we're going to want to have these three aspects involved in what we're doing. So if we're going to review, uh, we're going to have pastoral care. How are you doing? What's going on? Last time we were together, you said this was going to happen. You're going to talk to your grandma. How did that work? We're just going to want to spend some time with them. As we're building that relationship, we're going to want to spend some time in worship. Accountability. How, how did that actually turn out? You were going to share your testimony this week. Did you get a chance to do that? What worked? What didn't work? And then we're going to want to cast vision, reminding them that they're part of this. Part of obeying is teaching others and building those relationships. And so these are the things that are going to help build that relationship. The new is going to be whatever the new lesson is. And then the obedience is going to be practice. So again, going back to that sharing your testimony idea, if, if we're doing an evangelism class as part of our discipleship making, we're going to talk about how do you share your testimony with somebody? If we just give that theory and we never break into pairs and share our testimony, they're not really going to be able to do it. And then plan. That's great. Now you know how to do that. When are you going to do that? Specifically, when are you going to do that? Which then becomes the fodder for coming back the next time for accountability. Okay. Which of these things are essential for multiplication, for seeing the kingdom of God expand? Which of these things do we need to do if we want to see growth in the kingdom? All of them. All of them. That's right. Which are the ones that we leave out almost all of the time? 
which are not part of what we normally do. Practice the relational. And pastoral care. Actually, accountability. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're really good at the new lesson. But the other <laughs> we're really good at the new lesson, and everything else drops off. So you have an hour. What are you going to do in that hour? Well, I'm going to talk for an hour. And I'm going to teach them 20 things. And the next week, I'm going to teach them 20 new things. And the next week, I'm going to teach them 20 new things. And at the end of that month, maybe they remember one of those things. Maybe. But if I teach them five things, and we practice, and we plan, and I hold them accountable, and then five things, practice, plan, hold them accountable at the end of the month, they're going to know 20 things. So one of the things that is important to me is the need to slow down in order to speed up. If we actually want to see multiplication, if we want to see disciples making disciples, reaching the world, extending the kingdom, uh, then we need to have a whole different philosophy of how we go about making disciples. And so I want you to just to take just a minute or two. I know with the six feet, normally I'd say get into groups of three or four, but I don't know that we're allowed to do that. So just where you are, just for a minute, think about the next opportunity you have to make a disciple and what would be different than what you have done the last time. I'll just give you a minute to think about that. Anybody have a thought that you would want to share? Sure. I'll fire you. Uh, I think for me, definitely the Come up from an intervarsity background. I think one of the things is you know you meet with someone, you get them excited. They're if they're a Christian, it's like let's get you going now. Let's get you you know who are your friends? Let's talk to me and equip you. Or even if they're a non-Christian, hey, who are your friends? <laughs> so like I think the the reality of actually slowing down is and to really say how we how we focus on the foundation. No one at mission is going to be there. Uh, but how to focus on the foundation and walk with you in a more organic way versus, hey, we've got the time of the semester and we've got to get a Bible study going, and a small group going. And I think trying to push people too quickly into practice without taking that time to really review and, and build that relationship so there's more of that trust as you challenge. Anybody else? On a, on a personal level, mm -hmm. I think I would want to be even more articulate about Jesus as the nexus of the universe. I'm so steeped in catechesis that the relationship mm -hmm. is the motivating factor always. That's the way Jesus made disciples. And uh, doing practice, we become what we do but being a little more articulate about Jesus because our culture doesn't get it. It's an assumption uh, that, you know, I've, I've been around here for 34 years and there are assumptions that we can't afford to make. Good. Okay. Um, let's see. I think this is going to be the eraser. So just one second. This marker board will have no COVID. Okay. One more aspect of uh, looking at this circularly. Um, we go into all the world to make disciples, but bringing that circle back around, why do we make disciples? to go into all the world. So we're gonna go into all the world to make disciples and then we go and make disciples to go into all the world. Nothing in life is linear, so this is all make-believe. Um, as you get involved in ministry, you're gonna find that it doesn't quite work that way. But as we're looking at doing missions in an unengaged, unreached people group, we're trying to figure out what is it that we're going to do one of the failures of the giants on whose shoulders we stand, and so we have learned so much 
from watching other missionaries go before us, but oftentimes what has happened is those of us who have the gospel go to what we call a mission field and create a mission field mentality where they think that forever until Jesus comes back, they are the mission field and they need to depend on us. Uh, what has been called in the past from the West to the rest, although that's not actually accurate because it started in Jerusalem and worked its all the way all the way around the world. But sometimes we go in with a mission strategy of always being involved in the mission field instead of we make disciples to go into all the world, we go into all the world who make disciples and that process continues. And so what we do when we're involved in ministry needs to change depending on where we are in that process. And like I say, I'm just going to put it linearly here. But understand that it doesn't exactly work in a straight line. And I think our work begins at zero. And what I mean by that is a lot of the work that needs to be done in terms of missions today is with unengaged, unreached people groups. And so by definition, nothing is happening. So we are at zero. We need to have prayer and advocacy to reach the unengaged peoples. And as we begin to pray for them, someone is going to be called out and say, I will accept responsibility. And this is where a missionary is sent. That's actually just step one. The missionary is being sent. And the reason I started putting together my thoughts in this way is there's a very great organization that's a partnership between multiple mission agencies, and it's called Finishing the Task. I don't know if, you've, if you're familiar with this organization, but they meet every couple of years, and we're going to finish the task because we want Jesus to come back, and we want to get every unengaged, unreached people group adopted and have a missionary with a church planting plan in place for every people group. And that's just step one. So, like, why, why do you call yourselves Finishing the Task? I've Encourage them to change their name to starting the task, but um, hasn't happened yet. The next step is, okay, a missionary has been sent. They go and they share the gospel. They're doing EV or evangelism. They're sharing the gospel. Someone responds to that gospel, and now they have a believer from within that culture, within that community. What's the next thing that has to happen? When they have a believer, what do they need next? Resources. They need resources. They need to make disciples. So we don't just share the gospel with somebody and leave them. Oh, great. Now you know Jesus. But we need to begin to disciple them, to, to use some of that catechesis that you've been putting together, to help them know what does it mean to pray? What are the Ten Commandments and why do they uh, matter to me? Uh, when we were in India... Uh, there was a guy who had become a follower of Christ and started a Bible study and a group of people were coming and then somebody found out that he was sleeping with prostitutes. And some of the church people were appalled. This is terrible. This person, they've just totally fallen away. They don't love Jesus at all the way that we thought they did. And a friend of mine said, well, which one of you told him it was wrong to sleep with prostitutes? Oh, it's on us. We didn't make a disciple. We just assumed they'd figure it out. We have to teach them. And where is that going to happen? As we're sharing the gospel, as people are responding, as disciples are being made, they need to be brought into a community. We need to begin to establish a church where they can be a community of faith, where they can practice the liturgy, where they can practice the one and others that scripture tells us are part of being a disciple of Christ. And then as that church begins to expand, we need to help them understand how it expands from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and to the ends of the earth, and that they are just as responsible for that process as are the mission-sending countries or the mission-sending agencies, so that it's from everywhere to everywhere. And so that's one last set of circles I want to draw for you. Um, 
Maybe you have drawn these circles. I know that I have. Talking about Acts 1.8 and that we're to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Um, there's something very wrong with this picture which I have drawn for years. And that is, it's amazing to me how easy it is or was for me to miss it. Maybe you picked it up right away, but I always saw these concentric circles. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. What's wrong with that picture? It, it doesn't circle back, that's right. And it's also physical distance oriented, not cultural distance oriented. But Jesus didn't want us to miss that. When Jesus was talking to his disciples, it was very clear to them in a way that it really should be clear to anybody familiar with the New Testament what he was talking about. Who was Samaria? What do we know about Samaritans in the New Testament? New Age cousins. New Age cousins? <laughs> right. They loved the Samaritans. They were just a little bit further away. Is that right? No. How did the average Jew feel about the average Samaritan? They hated them. Okay. When Jesus said Samaritan, they weren't thinking, oh, and then the next block, the next larger circle, he was thinking, they were thinking, oh, those people we hate, those people we will walk miles to avoid, those people we will cross the street not to have to talk to. Every culture where the gospel has been planted has a Samaria. I cannot tell you who your Samaria is, but you know who your Samaria is. Um, most of the places we live, most of our work has been in uh, among Muslims, but often we've been working, like we worked in India, a predominantly Hindu country, um, and you would talk to believers who had come out of a Hindu background about reaching Muslims, and they're like, no, thank you very much. Those people should go to hell. And that's pretty much true of every culture. There's that one class of people who shouldn't hear the gospel because if they did, they might get saved and be with us in heaven. All of us have to figure out who that is. And wherever we go to do missions, we need to help them understand God wants them to work cross-culturally with that tribe that they've been at war with for years, with that people group that's very near to them, but not very dear to them. And then they'll be ready to go to the ends of the earth.